Thank you for having me here. And I was lucky uh, to also participate in a past Geo Neutrino Fest uh, with uh, some of the folks here in uh, Takayama in 2013. And I uh, was at a different institution at the time. And uh, I, I discussed how a Geo Neutrino detector, a mobile detector, uh, could help us get at the bulk composition of the mantle. But you know, my interests changed a bit. I'm still interested in this other question. So is Bill McDonough and others in the audience. But now my, my interests are sort of moving um, in other directions. How we can look at uh, heterogeneities, compositional heterogeneities in the Earth's deep interior. And specifically, you know, we have a couple of tools, uh, seismology and geo, uh, geochemistry principally, to, to investigate the composition of the Earth's deep interior. Um, and you know, the seismologists tell us that uh, you know, there are two large continent-sized features at the base of the Earth's mantle, resting atop the core. We call these uh, large, low shear wave velocity provinces, seismic shear waves, and P waves travel more slowly through these large bodies. But we don't know what they are. Um, it's one of the big mysteries of deep Earth science. Uh, and I think it's really few neutrinos are going to help us make enormous strides in this direction. It's time for uh, geophysicists to embrace multi-messenger geophysics to get at these big questions about the Earth's deep interior. So we live in a dynamic, dynamic planet, uh, and uh, the, it's, the depths of the mantle are inaccessibly deep. On the Earth's surface, as we all know, uh, we have uh, the crust is divided into a number of plates, tectonic plates, which move around with respect to each other. Uh, inevitably, two plates will collide, um, and um, we see that I'm having trouble with this mouse. Maybe I should just give up on this mouse. Uh, yeah. Ultimately, when one uh, plate subducts under the other, that plate will go into the Earth's interior. So this is really the third dimension of plate tectonics. And then what, what happens to that plate over geologic time is, is an important question. That oceanic crust and sediments on top of it, and the oceanic lithosphere, mantle lithosphere beneath the crust and sediments, goes into the Earth's interior. Uh, how long does it stay down there? And uh, what does it turn into over geologic time? Of course, this is difficult to address directly uh, because, as you've heard in previous talks, we've never actually drilled a hole uh, to the Earth's interior. Um, uh, sorry, uh, to the Earth's mantle. The Soviets made a valiant attempt at the Kola drill core. Uh, they started in 1970 and they drilled for 22 years. They made it about 12.3 kilometers depth. Now, unfortunately, they drilled at a location where the crust is quite thick in a continental location, so they got nowhere near mantle depth. They didn't drill all the way to the mole hole. So you really want to drill in an oceanic setting where the crust is thinner. And in an oceanic setting, uh, you have another problem, and that's that you have four, five, six kilometers of water between the drill rig and the ocean floor. And you know, this is the first time I saw this come out in the kind of the international media with this article in CNN in 2012, I took a screenshot and kept it, uh, really talking about the Chiki, the, uh, the drilling vessel that you've heard a little bit about, um, and the possibility that this new drilling vessel could allow us to drill through the oceanic crust to the mantle for the first time for the low, low cost of $1 billion. I'm not sure if this estimate still stands, um, but it's nice to see stuff like this make it to the international media. But even then, if we drill six kilometers to the oceanic crust, we're still a long shot from drilling down to the core. That's 3,000 kilometers. So just to envision 3,000 kilometers, that's really the distance between LA and Chicago. A nice nonstop flight, about 3,000 kilometers. So that's the thickness of the Earth's mantle. And we're not really hoping to drill to that depth. But fortunately, there are other ways for us to get it the composition of the Earth's deep interior. And that is with mantle plumes. So the Earth, you can think of the Earth as a giant engine. All right, and it has primordial heat in it left over from accretion, but also radiogenic heat from the decay of uranium 
chlorine, potassium in the Earth's interior. And the Earth needs to evacuate this heat somehow. And one method of uh, that the Earth, uh, one mechanism for uh, the Earth uh, to lose heat is through plumes, which uh, form at um, thermal boundary layers, like that which exists at the core mantle boundary. And these plumes, these plume conduits, will then uh, rise due to their higher temperature and lower buoyancy, and they will entrain material from the Earth's deep interior. And that material can be entrained to the, the shallow mantle where it melts and erupts at uh, hot spots, like Hawaii, for example. And these lavas, we refer to them as ocean island basalt lavas. Uh, geophysicists are presenting to us ever finer detailed images using seismic tomographic methods to, to show us these low velocity conduits like this one, which has been imaged beneath Pitcairn Island in the South Pacific. And there are at least uh, 28, maybe more other such conduits visible in the world's oceans. And when these plume conduits rise, they rise over laterally moving plates. So as you can see in the, the far right image, you have a volcano that will form above the upwelling, melting plume conduit. The plate will advect off to the left, or to the west in this case, and then a, the original volcano goes extinct and a new volcano forms, and so forth, until you have a nice linear age progressive chain of volcanism, like that which we see in Hawaii, uh, where you have submarine island, or subaerial islands that are active to the east as you go down plate flow direction, you have older islands with fringing reefs, atolls, and then seamounts that have eroded and thermally subsided. And we have uh, perhaps 40-odd uh, uh, hotspot locations in the world's oceans that we can look at. Uh, each of these are shown in this figure here uh, with Hawaii, Iceland, and Louisville as three prominent examples. But there are about 40 others shown as well. And um, this provides us with, uh, and also in addition, there are conduits here modeled by uh, Bernhard Steinberger, showing how the plume conduit would have to the surface location of the hotspot, which is shown. So in each of these locations, we have the potential to then find out the composition of the Earth's deep mantle composition. Material would have been infected to the surface via these plume conduits at each of these locations. We can start to map out the distribution of uh, geochemical reservoirs from the Earth's deepest mantle. And what we see is a spectacular diversity of composition. So this is showing radiogenic isotope ratios, strontium isotopes, 87, 86 strontium, or 87 strontium forms as a result of 87 rubidium K versus 206, 204 lead, where 206 lead forms as a result of 238 uranium decay. And each of these data points represents an individual lava sample from one of a number of different hotspots. And there's an incredible diversity of compositions here, and uh, the different compositions are broadly given Names, not very creative names, I'll add. MORB is mid-ocean ridge basalt erupted at mid-ocean ridges where plates spread apart. High mu is uh, an exotic composition with very high 206, 204 lead ratios. And oh, about 30 years ago, Hoffman and White suggested this might form from ancient subducted oceanic crust, which uh, evolved in the Earth's interior. Then EM1 and EM2, which all group together as EM for most of this talk, means enriched mantle 1, enriched mantle 2, very high 87, 86 strontium ratios. White and Hoffman suggested this might result from ancient subducted continental materials. So continental crust going to high 87, 86 strontium. Oceanic crust going into the mantle will evolve to high 206, 204, high mu composition. So you're really looking at this diversity of compositions in the mantle resulting from this subduction package of oceanic crust and perhaps the sediments attached. So the takeaway message here is the Earth's mantle is extremely heterogeneous. We've known this for a long time, and this gives rise to some of the biggest questions in uh, solid earth geochemistry. First, how did the Earth's mantle become heterogeneous? 
more broadly for the isotope systems we were just looking at, it's probably subduction, which is driving most of the heterogeneity or injecting very heterogeneous materials into the Earth's interior over geologic time. Another question is, what are the bulk compositions of these different reservoirs? I think we can get at that with uh, two neutrinos. We'll get to that in a moment. And when did the various reservoirs form in the Earth's interior? I think we can start to talk about that, uh, specifically for continental crust subduction, and when the EM reservoirs formed. And finally, can we determine where these different geochemical domains are located in the Earth's interior? So this start off with one example for how we approach this problem. Um, so this is a plot of neodymium isotopes in the y-axis versus strontium isotopes on the x-axis. What's really important here is continental crust exists way down and to the right on this plot, the direction of that red arrow. Plot continental crust, upper continental crust samples will often plot way out of the side of the, this figure, down and to the right. Uh, whereas the upper mantle, which was which experienced continental crust extraction over the course of Earth's history, uh, will melt and generate mid-ocean ridge basalt. And uh, during my PhD years, that, that gray field in the middle uh, kind of defined the global range of ocean island basalts that erupted at hot spots. And my, my second time going to sea was in 2005. Uh, we sampled some lavas off the flanks of uh, one of the Samoan islands, Savai'i, with this really, uh, really high-tech method known as dredging. And we put out about six or seven kilometers of 50,000 pound test cable, drag a basket along the ocean floor and pull the rocks back up to the surface. And we've been doing this really well since 1880. You can see that the technology has improved a lot actually hasn't improved really at all, but we pulled up some, some rocks, took them into the lab, measured their isotopic compositions, and we have some really extreme compositions here that are going down towards continental crust. Really, in all respects, these lavas give given us smoking gun signatures for, for ancient continental crust subduction to the mantle and then brought up again to the surface in the plume that feeds the small and hot spot. But where, are, where is this enriched mantle reservoir? Well, I remember during my PhD years sitting in the office with my thesis advisor, Stan Hart. And he gave me this wonderful analogy that rings true about the difficulty of identifying where these reservoirs are in the Earth's interior, specifically this enriched mantle reservoir. It, he had this analogy of the zookeepers. He said there are geochemical zookeepers who know which animals are in the mantle zoo, right? But these geochemical zoo zookeepers, they don't know where the cages are. On the other hand, there are the seismological zookeepers. But they know where the cages are, right? The seismological zookeepers tell us that there are red cages and then there are blue cages, but they don't know which animals are in these cages. EM or high mu, which animals are in these cages? So it's very difficult for the geochemical zookeepers and the seismological zookeepers to speak to each other. One group knows where the animals, well, one group knows where the cages are and the other group knows that which animals are there. We really need geoneutrino zookeepers. What if the animals had high geoneutrino luminosity and so we could see where these animals are and evaluate whether or not those animals are actually in one of these red cages or blue cages. So this is a really, really exciting thing to think about. Where is EM? Where is high mu? Seismology and geochemistry aren't enough to help us find out which animals are in which cages. We really need an additional messenger uh, that can tell us about where the different reservoirs are in the Earth's deep interior. Okay, there has been work on this for, for more than 30 years now using two messengers, uh, seismology and geochemistry. Uh, folks worked out uh, just over 30 years ago that these uh, enriched, enriched mantle creatures uh, 
seem to be associated with low seismic velocity regions in the mantle. So first, in 1984, uh, Stan Hart uh, showed that hot spots located in the southern hemisphere in this, this belt right here uh, all tend to have enriched geochemical signatures. So they have low 143, 144, high 87, 86 strontium. So these signatures that we associate with continents. And then four years later, Pat Castillo realized that these regions of geochemical enrichment where these where the basalts at the surface, these hotspot basalts are extremely enriched. These bullseyes here and here correspond with the low velocity regions in the deep mantle, these, these large red blobs that you've seen, the LLSVPs in the uh, previous slides. But this is, over the last 30 years, global seismic velocity model, models and uh, geochemical databases have improved substantially. So I worked with uh, Torsten Becker and Bernhard Seinberger to, to look at this again to see where things have come along in the last 30 years. So here, this is showing the location of global oceanic hotspots. We avoid hotspots in the continents. We focus just on oceanic hotspots to avoid continental cross assimilation issues. And uh, the size of the symbol, so the location of each hotspot is at each symbol. The size of the symbol tells you about the lowest 143, 144 value at that hotspot. So the larger the symbol, the more uh, it reflects a composition that we might associate with continental crust. Small symbols have higher 143, 144, which are less like continental crust. What you'll see first is that uh, all the largest symbols that have continental crust signatures are within the boundaries or tra are traced by plume conduits to within the boundaries of the LSVPs. But more importantly, these continental signatures of hotspots are only found in the southern hemisphere. So here's a plot of uh, latitude versus the minimum 143, 144 to each hotspot. And the 11 hotspots of the lowest 143, 144 are all in the southern hemisphere. So there's something in the southern hemisphere portions of the LSVPs that have very strong continental signatures. So why is this the case? Well, this is similar to this observation from 1988. It's becoming clearer, though, that it's really the southern hemisphere portion of LSVPs that has a strong continental signature. So how does this happen? How do you generate this geographic distribution of continental enrichment in the southern hemispheric mantle? Well, this has been a big question now for over 30 years. I've thought about it my entire career. The best idea that we've been able to come up with, I'm working with my colleague Francis McDonald at UC Santa Barbara, is that Gondwana assembly from 650 to 300 million years ago ex experienced a lot of continental collisions. And these continental collisions occurred in the southern hemisphere. Gondwana was a southern hemisphere supercontinent. Right, if you were uh, approaching the Earth in a spacecraft from the northern hemisphere, and during this time period, 650 to 300 million years ago, Earth would have looked like a water world. There was essentially no land in the northern hemisphere. All the land was in the southern hemisphere. Now, these continental crust collisions would have resulted in continental crust being subducted into the Earth's interior. Well, there's a problem with this hypothesis because continental continent, supercontinents formed many times in Earth's history. And so during the Precambrian, continental assembly and subduction would have occurred also in the northern hemisphere, at all latitudes. So we should expect to see these continental crust signatures in hot spots at all latitudes. But we don't. We only see it in the southern hemisphere. So this is as far as I got, right, for the last 20 years. What I needed was a mechanism in which deep continental crust subduction turned on at the moment Gondwana started to assemble. Okay, this is kind of a ridiculous thing to request. But then it, it turns out that Earth underwent a dramatic transition in the style of subduction starting about 650 million years ago. So maybe this wasn't such a big request. 
So this is looking at a database that uh, Mike Brown at University of Maryland put, to, uh, put together uh, several hundred very well characterized metamorphic rocks and he plotted their temperature over pressure ratio. So this, this gradient over geologic time and he finds that about a billion years ago we go from a warm and shallow metamorphic regime on the planet to a cold and deep metamorphic regime so that these metamorphic rocks tend to form a cold at colder, deeper environments. And at the same time, this is showing a continental and oceanic uh, high pressure, ultra high pressure rocks, so very low temperature over pressure rocks. At the same time, we see the first appearance, so these, these blue and yellow symbols are related to pressure here on this axis. We see the rise for the first time of very high pressure continental rocks. Continental rocks are going to high pressures for the first time starting at 650 million years ago, extending to the present day. So indeed, we see a transition in the metamorphic rock record where rocks are going to high pressures, very high pressures for the first time about 650 million years ago and ramping up the high pressures over that time period. Okay, the question is, well, what's responsible for that transition? Something about the thermal regime of the planet, but why would continental crust start going deeper? Well, there's... Uh, just recently, one idea is that uh, the viscosity of, or the rheology of, sorry, the rheology of uh, subducting lithosphere was such that at continental passive margins where the oceanic lithosphere is attached to continental crust, the oceanic lithosphere in a hot mantle would simply detach from the continental crust before it could pull it down too deeply. But as the Earth cooled, we have a rheologic change occurring in that slab, where that slab, which is connected to the oceanic crust, can pull the continental crust to much greater depths before that slab breaks off. And remember, continental crust is going to be buoyant in the shallow upper mantle, but the continental crust becomes negatively buoyant if you pull it down past uh, about 9 GPA. And the idea is that that would have been possible more recently in Earth's history, as the Earth cooled and the rheology of the slab changed, that it was sufficiently strong to pull the continental crust down past 9 or 10 GPA before breaking off. And that would then explain why we have continental crust going down to very, very high pressures. You can look at that going up to maybe 7 GPA here. Presumably, it's well, we don't have deeper stuff because that simply kept going down into the Earth's interior. Okay, so we have this mechanism at 650 million years ago, starting at about the time of Gondwana assembly, when we start seeing continental crust going down deep into the Earth's interior for the first time, and that happens when the continents are in the southern hemisphere. So continental material is going into the mantle in the southern hemisphere for the first time 650 million years ago, this is showing the average latitude of the continents going back a billion years. And it's really at 650 million years ago, the continents were well into the southern hemisphere, and this is when we, we see the first ultra high pressure continental rocks in the geologic record. So, when we first see the appearance of continental, deeply subducted continental crust, the continents happen to be in the southern hemisphere. So, it's this beautiful geologic coincidence. The continental crust was going into the Earth's mantle for the first time when the continents were in the southern hemisphere. And this is great because it's in the southern hemisphere that we see the continental crust signatures most clearly in hotspots. Okay, you might be asking yourself, well, what about the last 300 million years when we have the continents migrating into the northern hemisphere? Continental collisions have still been occurring in the last 300 million years but we don't see evidence of those of the continental crust of the northern hemisphere. And I think the reason for that is because it takes about 200 million years for subducted crust to reach the core mantle boundary. It takes about another tens to 100 million years for that material to come to the surface, and that's not to mention the time that the subducted material sits on the ocean floor. Oh, sorry, at the core mantle boundary. 
So that 300 million years there, 200 plus 100 here, plus the time it spends at the core mental boundary, explains why material subducted from 300 million years to the present day isn't seen in hot spots yet. It hasn't had time to go down to the bottom and come back up again. And what about all that time before 650 million years ago? Well, it doesn't matter because continental crust wasn't subducting yet. You see that in the geologic record. So it's this window from 650 million to 300 million. Here's a nice plate reconstruction that it shows exactly this, right? This line comes from the average latitude of the continents from this model adapted from Murdoch's. 650 million years when you see the first continental crust, ultra high pressure formation, ultra high pressure, ultra high pressure metamorphic rocks. So 300 right there. And each of the blue lines you saw was a continental collision event where you have uh, a mapped passive margin collision. And these are this, these are the nurseries for formation of ultra high pressure continental rocks. So there's a geodynamic consequence of continental crust in the southern hemispheric mantle. If you have lots of continental crust in the southern hemispheric mantle, continental crust is really rich in uranium and thorium, like two orders of magnitude more rich in uranium and thorium than ambient mantle. So you have more austral radiogenic heating, and so I think more plumes. So imagine you have your two LLSVPs, right, and these red blobs would be continental crust that's managed to find its way into the deep mantle. These are producing excess radiogenic heat, so you should generate more plumes. And I think this is a good explanation for why you have far more hot spots in the southern hemisphere than in the northern hemisphere. It's a spectacular difference. In fact, when I made this plot, I had to check to see that I hadn't made an error in the plot. It's such a spectacular difference in the number of hot spots you have in the southern hemisphere versus the northern hemisphere. And we know that radiogenic power carried by all mantle plumes is at least two terawatts. That two terawatts can be generated by, if, if all that two terawatts is generated by subducted continental crust, and obviously not all of it can be, right, if some of these northern hemisphere hotspots have nothing to do with continental crust. But if, if we assume two terawatts is generated by subducted continental crust, that would be equivalent to one third of the size of the modern continents. So a mass of modern continents, one third of the size of the modern continents would generate about two terawatts of radiogenic power, which could power uh, mantle plumes, this excess of mantle plumes in the southern hemisphere. Okay, this is, this is wild and speculative, and mantle geochemists are, are, are guilty of doing this all the time, but they never have a way to really test it because the Earth's mantle is so deep. But a gene neutrino detector really opens up the possibility that we can test this hypothesis. We've known for over 30 years the southern hemisphere <coughs> portions of the LSVPs are enriched in continental crust. The continental crust has a two orders of magnitude higher uranium and thorium than ambient mantle. And if we have a, enough continental crust in the, in the southern hemisphere portions of the LSVPs, the southern hemisphere portions of LCP should be really high, should have really high gene neutrino luminosities. We can absolutely test this hypothesis. Well, folks keep talking about the LSVPs in general being uh, enriched relative to ambient mantle. This this might be true, but I think I think the southern hemisphere portion of the LSVPs uh, we 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 see the strong association with uh, continental crust signatures. The continental crust has such an overwhelmingly high concentration of uranium and thorium that there really exists the potential here to, to map out enriched mantle domains uh, in the Earth's deep interior. Now, in order to do this, the detector has to be in an oceanic setting because obviously near field geo neutrinos in continental crust are going to be a real problem for detecting continental crust signatures in the deep mantle. Uh, because continental crust is you know, 30 kilometers thick, has really high uranium and thorium concentrations, it's going to obscure any smaller signal we have from deep Earth uh, geodendrinos. So we need a, a detector that's in the oceans 
The detector needs to be mobile so it can map out the distribution of uranium and thorium rich regions in the mantle. I, I, I think there are so many reasons to have a detector like this in the Earth scientists. It really turns deep earth geochemistry into a field where we have hypotheses that we can test. Uh, it would truly revolutionize uh, my field uh, of deep earth mantle geochemistry. Okay, I'll take any questions. Thank you.